I'm not sure what your thoughts about Easter are today. Maybe it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. And maybe uh, for you on a regular day basis, it, it doesn't really, it's not something you think about. Maybe you uh, showed up or logged in because, you know, your family said, you better go to church on Easter. Or maybe you were told that you wouldn't be allowed to eat ham unless you came with the family. I don't know what it is. Maybe you were just looking for an opportunity to get out of the house, <laughs> right? COVID, like, hey, we can finally get out the house. Or maybe you're a parent and uh, you heard that we were offering nursery and you're like, free babysitting for an hour, woo! Okay, so that's, that's totally fine. Uh, we provide both of those things every single week from now on, I think. So that'll be great from birth to four years old. But listen, regardless of why you're here today and where you're coming from, uh, I do wanna say this, I am really glad, super glad and honored that you chose to make our gathering a part of your weekend plans. And most of all, I want you to know that those of us who call ourselves Clarity, especially some of you who helped us start it, and there's a lot of you who are still here, we started Clarity with the hopes that every person can explore faith in God in a community of empathy and grace. That's what we hoped. And so today we are launching a new series of messages on this theme of doubt in the life of a Christian, how doubt is a necessary expectation in the life of someone who has already, listen to me, who has already made a commitment to submit their life to Jesus and how our doubts do not disqualify, but instead qualify the journey that is described as being a disciple of Jesus. And that's good news for you if you're someone who doesn't know whether you believe everything about Jesus and the Bible, because here's what I want you to know. When I speak of doubt, I'm not talking to the person who's like, oh, who doubts Jesus and doesn't believe. I'm literally talking to the person who has in their heart said, I want to follow Jesus, but I still doubt. In the words of the sinner, famous prayer, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That is the the, that is the person I'm talking to. And so if you're someone who's far away from faith, you're included too. So don't tune me out today. Hopefully you'll find a little bit more clarity on who Christ is by the time we get to the end of this. But before we get to the doubt talking about stuff, today is Easter. If you didn't know, today is Easter. And I wonder if you have ever heard the story. I wonder if you have ever heard the story. And there may be, if not all of you today, who have maybe listened to the story. Maybe you've listened to the story. You saw the flannel graph, as I've talked about, I think now two weeks in a row. We've got to get a flannel graph. Can someone make me a flannel graph, please? <laughs> maybe you've listened to the story. But I wonder if you've actually ever read the story. Have you read the story? Today, I, I want to do that with you. And, and maybe it's been a while since you've read the story. You've heard it. You've heard the people say, Jesus is alive and he rose from the dead. But have you read the story? Today, I want to read it with you. John 20 is where we're at today. And we'll start at verse 1. In most of your Bibles, you'll see the heading. Either the empty tomb or the resurrection of Jesus. And I just want to read this with you together. It says this, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. First day of the week is what? Sunday. Okay. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. At that, Peter and the other disciples went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. This is a really funny aside. Um, by the way, most people believe that John the disciple wrote this, and John the disciple is often the one that Jesus loved. And here, John is basically saying, we both ran, but I beat him. Okay, thanks, buddy. All right. Yes, Jesus loves you the most, and you're faster. If you didn't catch that, this is why you have to read the scripture. Honestly, seriously. So 
you catch these things and it's just funny, it's hilarious. Verse 5, stooping down, he saw the linen clothes, cloths lying there, but he did not go in. I wouldn't go in either. I'd probably be terrified. Verse 6, then following him, Simon Peter also came, and he entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. Because that's Peter, you know, step out on water. Like, oh, you're not going to go in? I'm going to go in, right? This is stuff we know, right? Verse 7, the wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, there you go again, then also went in and saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Pause right there. They did not yet understand that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away the Lord, she told them. And I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener. (laughs) Come on, guys. That's funny. Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him. I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, (laughs) Jesus told her. Since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. So there are two sides of this story that we just read. The first one is obvious and it's often talked about. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He defeated death and he is who he said he was. He is God. That's the one we know, right? That's the good news. That's awesome. That's the first side of the story. It's what we talk about at Easter. It's what we like to talk a lot about. But the other side is the one that isn't really talked about as much, but it is just as obvious if you look at the text. This is nothing new. I'm not telling you, I found something new. If you do study of this in the scripture, they talk about it just as much in the scholarly, you know, books. They talk about Jesus and his power over death and what we're going to talk about next. They talk about just as much. And what is that? It's this, that doubt and skepticism have always preceded the belief that Jesus is who he said he was. This has always existed. Doubt and skepticism have always preceded the belief that Jesus is who he said he was. (laughs) Look at Mary. First, she has tears. Her tears are not of joy. They are what? Tears of sorrow. Where have they taken him? They've stolen him. And I don't know where he is. This is tears of not only sorrow, but of destruction. It's one thing that Jesus, who she held dear, died. But now his body has been stolen. And even after turning her face to Jesus, she couldn't even see that the person that her heart was longing for was right in front of her. Maybe it was the tears clouding her eyes. I don't know. But her perspective on the situation was causing her to see things 
through her worldview, through her immediate situation, and she couldn't see Jesus. I've been a follower of Jesus long enough to know that you don't have to be someone who only finds themselves at a church gathering once in a blue moon to know that sometimes it's hard to see Jesus as he truly is when we are overwhelmed with what we believe to be the realities of our current circumstances. It's hard to see Jesus as caring when it feels like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. It's hard to believe that Jesus said, take my burden for it is light. It's hard to believe that when the burden you're carrying is overwhelming. It's hard to see Jesus as the one who said, blessed are those who mourn when the sadness of mourning just doesn't seem to go away. It's hard to see Jesus as the solution to the problem of sin in your world, sin in your life, sin in our world, when we are consumed with anger, with guilt, with shame by the sin of others, by the sin of our own life. It's hard to see Jesus as the solution to sin when we have so much emotion regarding the effects of sin in our own lives. And the story of Easter doesn't stop here, though. It doesn't stop here. In fact, in verse 19, it says this. The story goes on. Take a look at this. When it was evening, it's the same day, right? When it was evening, of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked. I, I just need to say this, ain't in my notes, but I know, I know there's a lot of emotion regarding the current state of what it means for us to gather here as a church, but we don't have to lock any doors, okay? I want you to know that we are blessed with the opportunity to gather, whether it's even online or here in person with masks on. Here's the first Easter. We don't have to have the doors locked. But they did. But here's what happened. Even with the doors locked, Jesus came. Stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Verse 20, having said this, he showed them his hands and his sides so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And in there, there's a little bit of, and we won't have time to go into it, but when you receive the peace of the Lord, it's not just for your own benefit, but it's also for the benefit of others. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And here's what happens when you receive God's Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That's deep stuff. We don't have time to go into that. Let's keep reading on. But Thomas, called twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, hey, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, I don't know if he said it like that. I just, it's just how I think Thomas sounds right now. Put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will catch this. Never. I will never believe. Some of you have loved ones that have looked you in the eyes and said, I will never believe. And it has broken your heart. Let's see what happens to Thomas. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. It's a week later. Even though the doors were locked, still locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, <clears throat> put your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, My Lord 
and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Dr. Leon Morris is probably a widely regarded scholar <clears throat> on uh, the New Testament. He is, in fact, dedicated, he dedicated most of his life to the study and the interpretations of the writings of the New Testament. And his commentary in the Gospel of John is often referred to as one of the foremost scholarly writing of this subject. And I love, I love how he brings to light what is going on in this passage of Scripture. So from someone who's way smarter than me, I, I thought I would just read this and see if you could catch something that is meaningful to you. Here's what he says. This incident is of the utmost importance for an understanding of the way the first Christians came to know that the resurrection had indeed taken place. As Thomas makes abundantly clear, the appearances were not at first welcomed. They were resisted as idle talk. And those who had not actually seen Jesus for themselves refused to point blank to accept the story. Only the plainest of evidence could have convinced a skeptic like Thomas. No skepticism could be more thoroughgoing than this. And it is perhaps worth noting that nobody else in the New Testament makes demands like these before believing Thomas. Unless he puts, you know, nobody makes this kind of demand. This is often taken as indicating that Thomas was of a more skeptical turn of mind than the others, and of course, he may have been. But another possibility is that he was so shocked by the tragedy of the crucifixion that he did not find it easy to think of its consequences as being annulled. The evidence against it was so high that I can't ignore that, and it just Ugh, it can't cancel the fact that Jesus said he would arise. I know he said that, but uh, the evidence. Did you see the blood? Did you see the thorns in his skull? Did you see his side bleeding? Did you see his lifeless body? I can't get that out of my mind. But convinced he was, which shows us that the evidence was incontrovertible. I don't even know if I said the word right. He uses big words. It's like, remember I said he was a real smart guy. Incontrovertible? Incontrovertible? Is that how you say it? Thank you. Thank you. My great... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I can... I, can, I learned me to read. <laughs> you know, one of the greatest myths that people have regarding faith in Jesus is that doubt is opposite to faith. The idea is that if... Your faith in God is equal to certainty, then that means that any form of doubt or questions that you might have about the existence of God or even his role in the world would be considered the opposite of faith. And to some people, damaging. Oh, that you would question. Ah, oh, get out. And here's the problem with that kind of thinking if you believe that faith, and this, I had my wife read this yesterday, and she's like, this is the most confusing part of the message, just take it out. I'm like, no, this is really important. So you gotta listen. If you're falling asleep, please listen right now. It'll require some brain cells. Here's the problem with that type of thinking, that certainty is required for faith. Here's the problem with that thinking. If you believe that faith equals blind belief or certainty, and you should never, never, ever, 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 ever doubt, this definition of faith causes you to look for evidence to support what you already have believed, what you've preconceived to believe. Because instead of pursuing the journey of faith with an open heart and an open mind, that allowing God to transform you and his truths to transform your ideas, you will instead start with a preconceived idea of what growing in faith looks like. You will pursue faith saying, I think this is what it looks like. 
Instead of viewing being a disciple of Jesus as a journey of discovering what genuine faith looks like through the scriptures, you will instead view discipleship as a search for evidence that supports what you already believe. You don't need God to change you. You just need God to agree with you. And when you do that, you will build relationships only with people who agree with you. And you will eventually find yourselves being overly critical of those who disagree with you. Think about it. If you are taught that certainty in God's existence is what your eternity is resting on, then that is the point you will start from. And you will find any reason you can make you can find any reason you can find to make that true and you will only surround yourself with people who think the same as you because as long as you never leave the cozy cozy confines of your Christian circle that you've chosen to be a part of then your faith may never come under any kind of doubt it's safe here's the problem with that Throughout the centuries, anyone who has sincerely opened the scriptures with an open mind, with the heart of learning the truth of God and his existence from the scriptures, learning what God's role in the world is in the context of community with the scripture with people who have committed to also do the same, I believe that you will discover that doubts do not disqualify you from a deep life in faith in Jesus. And so over the next several weeks, today is kind of a preamble to the real start of the series. Over the next several weeks, I want to invite us all onto this journey through the scriptures with this one goal in mind to learn what it means to lean into our doubts, to ask questions instead of creating excuses, and to find ourselves gaining clarity on who Jesus is so that we can go from being the kind of person who says, I'll only believe if, to calling Jesus master, to calling Jesus Lord. But for a few minutes we have left together, oh, I got a few minutes, can I tell you why I'm willing to place my faith in Jesus and commit to following him? I just want to do that real quick. It's Easter. I got I to I talk about that. Can I talk about that? All right, here you go. One, here's the, here's, here's, here's the first reason. One, there's reasonable evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, Okay. People on both sides of the conversation debate about this all the time and nobody can prove one way or the other. Let's just be clear about that. I just believe that there is reasonable amount of evidence for me to place my trust on the fact that Jesus arose. I admit there's counter argument. I'm not saying that all the counter argument is bad. Some of it actually sounds really good. I'm like, mm, yeah, that's... It's pretty good. If I, yeah, if I were you and I believe that, I probably wouldn't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I'm just saying, I've done my own study, looked at the work that surrounds this, and I've said, you know what? <laughs> There's just enough evidence for me to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my trust in this Jesus. Second, when Jesus was put to death, all of his followers thought that he was dead. They thought it was the end. Nobody was saying Jesus died and I believe no one said that. They were hiding and they were feel fearful for their lives, but yet today, 2.2 billion people around the world claim to follow him. How did that happen? It was because of a thing called resurrection. It changed everything. Paul writes about the significance of this to the people in the city of Corinth who we read from about this whole thing regarding communion today. He writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. I passed on to you what was the most important, most important, most important, most important, 
most important. Okay, you get the point? I pass on to you what is most important and what has also been passed on to me. Here it is, ready? Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. So it wasn't like this individual, did you see him? Oh, I didn't see him with you, but I saw him on my own. No, we all saw him. Like, you see him? I see him. We say, oh, we're all together. We see him. We're like, ah, we see him. Okay, this is what was happening. Most of them who are still alive, he's writing this. And so he's saying, I'm admitting, if anyone doesn't think I'm right, they can tell me this guy's a liar. He's saying most of them who are still alive, though some have died. And we know that some of those had died because why? The Christians were being persecuted. So in the face of persecution, they were still saying, yep, mm -hmm, I'm going to still say Jesus is alive. You're going to die if you say that. Mm, Okay, let me think about it. Mm, Okay, Jesus is alive. Ah! Right? That's right. Then he was seen by James, his brother, and later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. So over a period of 40 days, more than 500 people claimed to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. The reason I believe those witnesses have credibility is because no one was getting wealthy off of it. No one was getting more power off of it. This was not some type of thing that you ascribe to so that you can get more influence, more wealth, win more friends and influence people, right? Start your own brand, become an influencer. No, this is not how it happened. Nobody was being launched into celebrity status because they said, I'm a follower of the way. As a matter of fact, they were killing people who made that claim, and yet people kept insisting, we're not making this up. It really happened. And the reason Christianity exploded overnight is not because of the teachings of Jesus or the miracles of Jesus. I'm not saying those aren't important. Those are super important, by the way, because you actually need those to be changed and know how to live a different life. But what I'm saying, the Christianity exploded because of the resurrection of Jesus. It's because of the amount of people who claim to have seen him. There were so many eyewitnesses to a resurrected Jesus that Christianity took off. And so the reason I believe is because Matthew, an eyewitness, wrote about what he experienced. It's because Mark, who spent time with Jesus' disciples, wrote about it. It's because Luke, an educated doctor, did some investigating and put some things in chronological order so we didn't miss a thing. It's because John, Jesus' close friend, the one who loves and happens to be a really fast runner, wrote about his experiences. It's because James, the brother of Jesus, and last time I checked, if you have a brother or sister, you were never tempted with the idea that they are Lord, okay? Jesus, J- Jesus' brother James, he wrote about it and said, he's Lord, it's because of what Peter, the guy who ran like a coward when he was confronted by a middle, middle school age girl, remember that? And he got, oh, you're one of Jesus' disciples. No, I'm not. Wrote about the resurrection. He, he wrote about, he preached about the resurrection and 3,000 people got saved. It's because of what Paul, who initially not only hated followers of Jesus, and, but look, he took pleasure in overseeing their executions. This is the guy because he wrote about the resurrection and wrote about his experience with the resurrected Jesus, I believe. You may have your reasons for not believing. I just find that there is enough for me to say I believe. And even though I still have a lot of questions, I'm I'm real with that. I'm not a blind faith type of guy. Listen, I have committed to a faith in Jesus because there is reasonable evidence that he actually... (laughs) defeated death. Even non-believing historians believe that Jesus was a character who had lived and walked the earth. So to say you don't believe in Jesus would mean that you don't believe in history. So let's just rephrase that. We all believe in Jesus. Let's just see these next few weeks as figuring out if Jesus was exactly who he said he was. Second reason, ooh, a hurry. Second reason why I'm willing to place my faith in Jesus. Can I give you a second reason? Is that okay? All right. Second reason why I place my faith in Jesus and commit to trusting him is because this. (laughs) This is the big one. This is the big one. Ready? Jesus offers to freely forgive my sins. He offers freely to forgive you and me of our sins. Now, we don't like to think about 
the reality that we need God's grace to cover our guilt because we are so used to thinking in terms of being good. We love the idea that good people go to heaven. And so we measure our lives on some sort of sliding scale. There's Billy Graham, there's Mother Teresa, they're like a nine and a ten, right? You're like, oh, way up there. And you know, compared to them, I'm not really like that good. But you know, when I look at, I don't know, those people. <laughs> when I look at, you know, oh yeah, you know, I look at, you know, I, I look at Josh over here. I mean, like compared to Josh, you know, we're leading worship. I mean, I'm pretty good, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding, right? So we, but we all do that. We all like, well, you know, I, I'm not like the saint, but you know, I'm, I'm better than that bass player with that tight beard, you know. <laughs> I'm better than him, for sure. The problem with this kind of rationale is that it becomes this guessing game of where we stand with God. And then we wonder why we wrestle with doubt. Because the very thing that we say we're certain of is simply just a guessing game. And the message of Easter is that you don't have to wonder where you stand with God based on your behavior. And you don't have to somehow, quote, measure up because God's grace covers the guilt of your past. As we say it a lot, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you have ever done that will cause him to love you even less. So every one of us who has opened our hearts to the grace of God, you can be confident in this where you stand with God. If you're an alcoholic or an addict or a pervert or a victim, God's grace is extended to you. And if you turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, guess what? His grace is enough to forgive you. If you committed adultery, if you're a thief, but you've opened your heart to God, guess what? His grace is extended to you. The murderers, the mama's boys, the freaks, the geeks, people who think professional wrestling is real, Uh, Chain smokers, everyone who does not... Sorry, Dan, I'm in my bed. (laughs) He's not coming back here. He's like, I'm moving to Texas. You just... Cardinal sin. Use the F word when it came about wrestling. Don't ever use the F word. Fake, fake. Everyone who does not use a turn signal, right? I mean, those people are like, "Oh, oh. You know, while texting and talking on the phone at the same time. Guess what? Jesus' grace is for them. To the Democrats, the Republicans, and everyone in between, to the guys at the gym who walk around the locker room naked singing Bon Jovi's, oh, halfway there. Right, you know those guys. All the dudes, you know, there's those guys. Mm, Anyways. To whoever is responsible for the creation and ongoing sale of Lululemon for men, I have good news. For those people, Jesus offers freely to forgive us of our sins. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ forgives sin once and for all. And I am one who is eternally grateful for that. Are you grateful for that? You are accepted by God. If you've placed if you've jumped in to the rhythm of saying yes to Jesus with your doubt, you're accepted by God. You don't have to wonder what God thinks about you because Easter confirms that you can be forgiven. As our musicians make their way back to close our gathering with one more song. Allow me to be super transparent. Or as uh, my good friend Jeff Varghese says, hyper honest, hyper honest Phil. 
I have a lot of questions myself. When it comes to faith. And maybe, maybe that's hard for you to hear a pastor say, and that's fine. You can go to some churches where you'll find a more than willing pastor to say, that's what it is and that's what it is. And I have no doubt whatsoever. And you can, that's fine. There's a lot of those churches. But I think it's healthy to have questions. Because when you ask questions, you learn things. And when it comes to faith, there are questions I have, but I also want to let you know that there are a few things that I have a reasonable amount of trust in, that I have faith in. And one is this. God loves me enough to sacrifice for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. I believe Jesus has the power over death and that there is hope for eternity. And last but not least, I believe that Jesus offers to forgive my sins and I don't have to earn it. I don't have to earn it. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is inaction. To allow these doubts to paralyze you into doing nothing, which is in itself, I guess, a course of action. <laughs> but that is the opposite of faith. And let's be honest with ourselves, we're all putting our faith in something, but God is not rattled by your questions, by my questions, by your doubts, by my doubts, because if something is genuinely true, it can handle our doubts and our questions.